topic uh, or uh, with the title uh, COVID-19 Reflections on Privacy and Resilience in a World of Easy Data. The moderator is uh, Dr. Angie Raymond, who is the director of the program <clears throat> on data management and information governance at the Ostrom Workshop. And she will be uh, introducing the rest of the panel. So I'm going to turn it over to here. Sorry, <clears throat> turn it over to her right now. Thank you very much. Um, joining me today is Janine Hiller. Janine Hiller is the RE Sorensen Professor of Finance at Pamplin College of Business at Virginia Tech. She joins us because her, her information and research focuses on the intersection of law, ethics, and technology in the context of business environments. Isak, who I've lost, Asri, is the Associate Director of Cybersecurity and Global Policy Program at Indiana University. He teaches courses on the policy of emerging technology, uh, particularly AI. Professor Scott Shackelford is at Indiana University as well. He's the Cybersecurity Program Chair and also the Executive Director of the Ostrom Workshop. Rachel Dockery is a Senior Research Fellow in Cybersecurity and Privacy Law at Indiana University, Maurer School of Law, and the Executive Director of the IU Cybersecurity Clinic. Uh, now, I'm going to share slides here really quickly, and we will, hopefully, and we will begin the conversation. So I'm fortunate enough to get to go first. And so, you know, big head panels as usual. So the framing question, we needed to frame the question when you get a panel of this diverse uh, group of individuals. So the framing question is to discuss the use of technology and the data it gathers in a responsible manner with the focus on the issues that arise in the face of the pandemic and that desire of technology deployments as one of the means to tackle the issue. So I'm gonna give a big broad overview and I don't wanna spend too much time because I really want to spend uh, time with the panel, it's it's the most beneficial. So what we're going to do is each of our panel members will speak for about eight minutes. And then at the end of that, we're leaving plenty of time for questions and answers. As we do know, you have questions and probably equally as importantly, it's quite possible that we need to bring our conversations together and not just have the group of us speak individually. So what I'm showing you here is, uh, these are actually directly from Microsoft, but these are privacy principles that have emerged uh, prior to the pandemic, in all fairness. And one of the things I want to say about this, this broad overview is one of the interesting conversations that now is occurring quite frequently are conversations about, I have data that we've already gathered for this purpose. Can I now deploy it for this new pandemic health crisis? And the answer is, ha, huh, good question. At least you're asking a question. It's shocking to me how often this conversation is not occurring. This idea of have a specific objective, gather data for the particular use, only gather the data that you need, keep it for only as long as you need to, and don't share it outside that circle of need. This has now evolved that conversation, which actually originally was coming up in context of things like cybersecurity, for example, in relation to the target data breach, which seems like a million years ago at this point, where the conversation was why target had all this information in the first place to lose. And so as these principles began to emerge very clearly in the community, we began to have new conversations. And so this is the conversation now that we're having oftentimes in the context of data gathered in, in the context of the COVID pandemic. Now, when I talk about this particular topic, it's actually a pretty easy one. When I talk to the students about it, I give them this example and I encourage them to go home and ask their family this, ask your grandmother, if she gets a phone call and someone wants to go out to lunch with her, they have a pressing issue they'd really like to run by her. They have that conversation, they leave. Does she post that conversation on Facebook? Is it even cross her mind to share it outside of that immediate family or that immediate situation? And the answer is oftentimes probably not. So the simplicity of this actual example gets us to the place that I like to start with. And that is, why is the digital community different? Why do we treat this different? We've had this rule for a long period of time. Gossipy people who share information that I've shared with them in private are no longer my friends or certainly not trusted individuals. And so from that context, and that's just a very broad conversation because each people's gonna, each of these people are going to add to this conversation. Um, but that's where I tend to start the conversation with. We actually know the social norms in general. 
And they are different amongst different cultures without exception. But when you have that conversation, you can boil it down to that example. It always perplexes me why we're having conversations about who gets to make those decisions. And it doesn't occur to anyone that actually the person who shared the information might be the first source of this. So now I'm going to move on uh, to Janine Hiller, who's going to talk about the resilience amidst the COVID crisis. Janine. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me, Angie, and everyone. Um, so I'm going to focus on the actual meaning of resilience, and I've done some work in the theory of resilience. But don't worry, we're going to go through that with regard to some pictures. So Angie, if you will get the next slide for me. I think this is the way we all are feeling right now, right? There is this tsunami of everything happening, not just with COVID, but with everything else. And we wonder if we're going to survive through everything that's happening. And COVID is a huge part of this tsunami that's hitting us. When we talk about resilience, how are we going to um, be resilient through COVID? Um, and Actually, I want us to think about it in two ways. How are we going to be resilient in a healthcare setting as a, a culture? And also how does privacy become resilient? When engineers think about resilience, they think about survival. And when they're thinking about it, they are defining it as when that tsunami um, is over, is that still a lighthouse? Is it still standing? And the problem is with this kind of approach is that it's very limited. It's not just survival of what we had, it is what is the future going to be like? Um, so engineering resilience can be too brittle. It, can, it, it defines um, resilience in terms of the breaking point. But there's another way to look at resilience and that's the next slide. So Angie, if, that, if uh, we can get the next slide. Okay, there we go. Um, my internet's a little slow, so I apologize, guys. Um, ecological resilience doesn't look at it in that way. Um, if we have um, a fire and all of the trees are destroyed for a while, it is not going to be the same forest. Um, in the engineering context, it might have not survived, and so it's not resilient. But Resilience also means how do you adapt? And there can be changes that are not, that make things different, um, but it also is not wrong if you can adapt to the changes. You can have, as this shows, beauty while the forest grows back, um, but it will grow back and the forest will grow back. That's the ecological way of thinking about what is resilience. When we think about healthcare then, healthcare is not the same through COVID. Um, it is going to have to change. It has to adapt. Um, for the next concept of resilience, which is the next slide. I'm going to start talking about it because I think it's a little slow on my side, um, is socio-ecological systems, which means that we, we have to look at this whole resilience um, through a lens that a lot of the other panelists are going to be talking about. I'm just going to basically tee it up for them here in that, um, why do we have the lighthouse? Why do we have healthcare? Healthcare curing, um, addressing the issues of COVID do not stand in isolation. If we um, look at privacy as dying and not being resilient because we need to use data during COVID, we're not thinking about how privacy relates to what's happening in society and why privacy is so important for individuals. Um, it might be different. We might adapt it for a while. It might change. How do we use those principles that Angie was talking about um, in a ways that when this is over, the healthcare system survives and privacy survives at the same time, even though they're both adapting. Um, and so that brings us to this final thought in uh, just bringing this all together. And that's a headline that came just a couple of days ago. When this is all over, and if data is used in the healthcare context for valid and very important reasons to address the COVID pandemic, the tsunami that's hitting us, where will that leave us? 
privacy concerns are on the upward trajectory. Individuals are very concerned about their privacy. And here's just a headline ripped from the, the news from, from Forbes. It said, we're at a tipping point and COVID is putting us there. As we think about um, the history of discrimination in healthcare, we can understand why some people don't want to download the app. When we think about the differences in the way um, individuals are treated based upon their gender and race, we can understand why da data collection is concerning to them. Um, and so the key to resilience, I would suggest, and just wrapping this up and handing it over to our wonderful other panelists, is that privacy and healthcare, for both of them to be resilient, they depend on each other. And the key and the connecting link, I think, is trust. The trust of the system to endure, uh, the trust of the use of the data, um, and it is, again, I would just to conclude to say that it's not just um, by itself. It's not just that lone lighthouse with the tsunami. It's a socio-technical system. And I think that the way we, we, we have to understand it is that so many other things are happening with our data at the same time. It's not just healthcare and COVID. Uh, COVID is putting it at a tipping point. So I look forward to hearing um, all of the other comments from the other panelists. Thank you, Angie. All right, well, thank you so much, Janine, and, and thank you, Angie, as well, for excellent moderating. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, I think, broadly um, uh, of a framework for discussing human rights in the context of the use of technology in responding to health crisis, um, and, and just sort of first speak about some really again, sort of broad strokes here um, and establishing framework. And then probably I, I will come to a very similar conclusion to what um, Janine just came to um, as well. Um, but the thing that we need to understand, and I'm sure many of, many of the audience understand this, is that not all human rights um, enjoy the same levels of protection. Um, instead, they can have differentiating legal characteristics with the main distinction being whether they're viewed as absolute or non-absolute um, in their nature. And on the basis of, of this understanding, um, many treaties and um, um, covenants you know, have established um, parameters under which it is okay um, to limit um, or restrict um, certain um, non-absolute um, uh, human rights um, for a time. But in order to do that, um, the following questions have to be asked um, and answered. Um, the first one is whether or not um, it's, um, there's a legal basis for, um, uh, for the measure that's going to be limiting this right, right? Um, the second is whether the limitation on the right um, is pursuing a legitimate aim, um, such, for example, as the respect um, of other people's rights, or, for example, um, in, in our case, uh, specifically uh, public health, right, um, protecting um, sort of public health. Um, the third question <clears throat> is that if so, if it's the legitimate aim, um, is the limitation necessary to achieve this legitimate aim? And is the extent um, of that limitation proportional um, in pursuit of that identified aim. And finally, there's this question of whether or not the restriction um, respects the principles of equity, um, is it non-discriminatory, et cetera. So let's look at each of those, <clears throat> and then I'll come to the few points in my slide. Um, if you look at each of those four questions um, in, in, in analyzing um, the technological solutions, the data-driven solutions that were that we've come up with um, to combat um, COVID-19, the spread of the pandemic. Um, the first question we might ask, we say, okay, well, is there a legal basis um, for for us, for example, limiting um, certain 
aspects of our privacy, for example, um, you know, to curb um, the pandemic. And we could say, yeah, I guess, absolutely, right? Yeah, um, you know, protecting human life and, and public health is a paramount concern um, to, to policymakers, right? Um, and so, so, yeah, we have a legal basis for doing it. Um, is it a legitimate aim? Similarly, 100%, it's a legitimate aim um, to stop um, the spread um, of, of a pandemic that's killing hundreds of thousands of people in our country alone. Um, but then we get to the third question, and, and this is where we start to see um, some of the issues. Is it necessary? Well, to me, I would say that a lot of the technologies that, we're, that we've sort of put out into the market um, to, to combat the pandemic, they may not be the appropriate tool. Um, and the reason that I say that is that a lot of the times um, they're due to the emergency nature of the situation, they're being put out without being tested um, and without being proven. Um, the issue is the use of unproven technology um, in, in this field, right? The untested, that it hasn't been um, uh, sandboxed, right? Um, sort of before um, it's, it's actually used in a real setting. And we have this long history of emergency measures um, that, that show that when surveillance of any form is introduced, it usually goes too far <clears throat> and usually stays beyond its intended purpose. It often outlasts its justification. Um, and so mobile tracking programs, as one example, um, that are intended to be used as temporary measures until the pandemic is over um, or until a vaccine is available, et cetera, could become permanent features of an expanded surveillance regime, um, which is concerning. Um, and so this and that itself opens gateways to restrictions of other human rights. Um, and so the fourth question then that we have to ask is whether this restriction um, of, of our right, and in this case, we're talking about privacy, right? Um, whether, whether, whether that restriction is um, in accordance with principles of equity and proportionality. Um, now, the Human Rights Watch um, has cautioned that over-reliance on mobile location tracking for COVID-19 responses could exclude marginalized groups who may not have reliable access to the internet and mobile technology, right? um, putting their health and livelihood at risk. Um, some communities such as migrant workers, refugees, and homeless people live in often in, in, in situations that are much more packed, um, making it less accurate, um, our, our sort of readings on contract, contract tracing less accurate. Um, and furthermore, um, many of these same communities um, have years of, of, of experience, generations of experiences um, being, um, persecuted and um, um, uh, uh, limited by autocratic um, governance, uh, go governments, etc. Um, and so we really should be quite concerned um, about the way that, that number one, everybody will have access um, to these new technologies, what type of data is being generated, and then how that data can propagate other abuses of our human rights. Um, and so, so the, the, this question of, of how we test it and how we deploy it is really, really important. But that ties me back to, um, to, to where we ended the last portion. Um, and and, and well, as I get ready to pass over um, to Rachel, um, is that we need to think about technology, not just as a, um, not just as an artifact, not just as a tool, but as an interlocking system of power, right? And, 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 that that, that 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 system right that interlocking system has the ability to create incredible change and incredible benefits that, that we can share across our society um, but it also has the opportunity to be to be totally misused and abused um, which can lead to um, not only abuses of our human rights um, but but then abuses of a lot of other things as well um, and so um, so so again I'd like to you know, emphasize that point of looking at technology as a social cultural phenomena um, and add that political dimension um, to it. 
um, as well. Um, <clears throat> and so just in, in, in summary here, I think point four on my slide um, is the important one that excessively compromising, for example, our privacy can become a gateway to undermining other rights, um, such as freedom of movement, expression, um, or association. Um, and this, this quote um, from Human Rights Watch um, in a Q&A they did in May 2020 on a similar question. They said that programs whose utility in controlling the pandemic has yet to be proven may introduce unnecessary and disproportionate surveillance measures in public health disguise. Um, so with that, I'll hand back over to you. Um, thanks everyone for having me here today. And especially thanks to ESOC for teeing up my presentation so well. I don't know if that was intentional, but it was very well done. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna link a little bit back to both of the presentations before me. So I'm speaking primarily through a lens of AI, emerging technologies, and privacy. But I think a lot of the overall point here is going to be the same. You know, when Janine's talking about resiliency and adaptation, the link being trust. I think that's an important link in ESOC's presentation as well. As you have this fear of technology potentially being abused, how do you build in mechanisms that, um, that create trustworthy or responsible actors? Um, and that's a lot of what, what I'm going to talk about. So thanks very much for, for teeing that up. Um, so COVID-19 has really provided an excellent case study for why a, a privacy law might or is necessary. Um, I really enjoy the title of this series of, you know, I don't know if it's Never Waste a Crisis or something along those lines. Um, but you know, where, where can we look to do good? And COVID-19 has really highlighted a lot of the issues we've seen in privacy um, over the past several, um, several years that is really kind of being a catalyst to bring those to the forefront. Angie kind of went over a few of these principles as an introductory remark, um, it's kind of stated within a healthcare context, but these are sort of, they illustrate where we might need to push the needle for a, a federal privacy law or emer new emerging state laws as well. Um, so the, the, I guess, points on this slide are adapted from a, an article I co-authored with the Center for Information Policy Leadership. So there's a link or you can Google that article. Um, but really the goal is just to look at what has COVID-19 taught us about data, AI and privacy. And really we've repeatedly seen the importance of data and the importance of technology to help with the pandemic. This really isn't any, any new news to us. We've known that technology has the potential um, to have enormously beneficial uses as Isak mentioned, and within the pandemic specifically, um, whether that's testing, um, tracking, tracing, researching, or on the other side of that, just facilitating our economies. Um, a website that used AI was one of the early, earliest indicators of a, an unknown form of pneumonia spreading throughout Wuhan. So we've seen repeatedly this case study about data being essential and AI and other emerging technologies being essential, the question is, you know, the how do you facilitate responsible use or how do you ensure that it's not being used in a in a way that's propagating surveillance or propping up surveillance. Um, so when you when once you move past that, the question becomes, you know, how do you how do you facilitate privacy? How do you balance privacy and human rights? ESOC did a great job of walking through human rights kind of in a broader perspective. So I'm going to maybe drill down a little bit on privacy more specifically um, and how privacy law can really help kind of provide these guardrails to build trust and how those guardrails can then turn into responsible development and deployment of AI. Um, Isak mentioned already the, that privacy is one of, one of many fundamental rights. Um, some of those rights are absolute, some are not, not all rights are created equal. Um, and the question here isn't whether we can have privacy or whether we can have public health. It's you know, how do we have both? Um, how do we strike that, um, that balance between the two? And a well-tailored privacy law ideally will have the flexibility to respond to a crisis while also protecting privacy. So you're not awarding the blanket um, suspensions or exceptions that as Isak mentioned, tend to 
outlast their justification. So if you have the, those parameters already in place and you don't need to provide those exceptions, that's the ideal privacy law that, that we're looking to pass. And in the US without a comprehensive federal privacy law, we have the ability to, to kind of look ahead and anticipate that. Um, so the fourth point on this list, traditional interpretations of data protection as, as being um, not ineffective, but just has provided an opportunity to look at ways to innovate around them, um, ways to facilitate responsibility in organizations, ways to create more accountability and more trust. Um, the, the one example I want to highlight is the, this, this around collection of data versus use of data. A lot of protections in the U.S. focus on collection. Um, the Fourth Amendment specifically is limited to protecting the collection of data, but once the government has the data, there are very few limitations on what it can then do with that data. Um, so that's one area where the traditional approach to data protection would focus on that collection, whereas a more modern approach needs to look at the things that Angie's already mentioned about um, limiting the use of data or um, focusing on a specific purpose for that data. Um, so it's kind of a combination of how do you look at the existing traditional interpretations of data protection principles, balance that with new innovative approaches, um, and really the goal going back to the rest of the, I think the overall theme of the first three presentations at least being to facilitate, facilitate trust. Um, so I don't want to go too much into that. I'm happy to explore further, but just to kind of summarize um, that COVID-19 has demonstrated uh, the remarkable power of AI, of data, and of new technologies, but has also highlighted these concerns around um, data reuse, surveillance, lack of transparency, um, and, and we just highlighted the need for new tools um, in order to balance privacy and other fundamental rights. And flexibility is important, but trust is key. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Scott Shackelford, who I think is going to talk to us a little bit more on the security side, um, maybe talk a little bit about contact tracing apps and other fun stuff. Plenty of fun stuff to continue on. Thank you so much, Thank Rachel. You. I really appreciate it. Fantastic presentation, as always, um, and to everybody. Nice job. And thanks again, Angie, for, for moderating and for ISC for doing all the heavy lifting here. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, picking up on that common thread, Rachel, I, I totally agree. Trust seems to be, as Lynn said, the most important resource in so many contexts, right? And I think that's only being highlighted in these really tumultuous times right now. Um, and frankly, that's a bit of an opportunity. It's an opportunity to rethink, you know, how we build trust, um, how we think more broadly about the impact of our actions. That's happening organizationally already. Janine and I, for example, have written a little bit on this evolution of benefit corporations and how that's in encouraging more elements in the private sector to think more broadly about risks, you know, pandemic and otherwise, frankly. Um, it's happening at the international level. Um, Rachel and, and Isak, as he was pointing out as well, you know, he, our thinking and our conceptualization of human rights law has evolved quite a bit over the last few decades, but there's still some fundamental problems, right? Including this fact that even though we have some wonderful UN General Assembly resolutions, such as the right to privacy in the digital age, a growing convergence around not only recognizing internet access, but privacy. You could argue even cybersecurity as fundamental human rights. The question is then, well, um, so what? <laughs> How do you enforce that, right? Um, I'm remembering Una Hathaway's great article, Do Human Rights Treaties Matter at the end of the day, right? So I think doing the heavy lifting of getting so many countries on the same page of building out that state practice is important, but we should recognize that it's a first step and certainly not the last step um, in, in building trust and protecting people online and offline, you know, during pandemics and otherwise. But that's just kind of a, a quick preface there. Um, and then, you know, frankly, when it comes to cybersecurity, the, the pandemic, of course, didn't create a lot of these problems, but it does um, exacerbate, you know, quite a few of them. And it shines, frankly, even a harsher light than was the case, I'd argue, before about the need to be more proactive in addressing um, a number of cybersecurity challenges, right? You guys see some up on the screen there. This is by no means, you know, a comprehensive list, but this is just to show you a little bit about some of the things um, that's going on. So per usual, in a very brief cybersecurity talk, I'll be depressing for the next couple of minutes, and then I'll end on an uplifting note about, you know, what we can do about it. Um, so some bad news. All right. You know, first off, I think it's quite depressing that nine of the top 10 coronavirus domains are in fact scams, and they continue to be scams to this day. So the spread of disinformation, as we all know, has been really endemic. Again, not a new problem. 
Um, but when lives are at stake, this really shows that we need to do a better job um, at managing it, right? At a lot of levels, and I'm happy to dig more into that, of course, as well. Um, it also has shown, frankly, the vulnerability um, you know, of, of a lot of people uh, working from home. So that can be you know, difficulties and fragilities with the way they're connecting to work with the VPN system. Um, it could be, frankly, the, the opportunities to exploit them. Um, that could be done through ransomware attacks, which are going through the roof um, this year. Though, of course, 2019 was another banner year. 2020, though, looks to, um, to go beyond that. And, you know, some of the risk mitigation tools that we have to deal with these challenges, like insurance, um, aren't quite up to task yet, right? As you guys see up there, there's big concerns and a lot, a lot of litigation going on right now about what, you know, simple questions like covered computer systems constitute in this context. With all of us working from home, what about our, you know, personal devices, maybe a personal laptop? Is that covered if that's the beginning of a larger breach in an organization? Um, and, you know, because of that, insurance rates are going through the roof because there's concerns um, about uh, how to, you know, monetize, how to think about this risk. Um, and that's making it even more challenging for small businesses, many of which are already on the ropes to afford coverage. And frankly, too many of them are still, you know, one ransomware attack um, or fraudulent wire transfer away from going out of business. Um, so again, the, the, these issues around, you know, protecting small businesses, protecting our critical infrastructure, doing more with the spread of disinformation um, aren't new, but the pandemic really does show that we can't leave them as back burner issues uh, because in an era when so much of our personal and professional lives is, is online, um, you know, it, we, we can't let them fester any longer. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going to the next uh, screen there, Angie, again, I'll try to be brief. So what are we doing about it? I frankly think there's a lot um, of, you know, some good news stories and plenty that we can um, can be doing. So, you know, we don't want to waste this opportunity as terrible as it as it is and as, as much suffering and, and death around the world as has already led to. It is a, you know, opportunity here. And this is probably too on the nose to build back better <laughs> in lots of ways. Right. And, you know, in part that we're seeing the way there in the um, in the U.S. and the EU. So in the EU context, you know, they've taken a much more comprehensive approach, of course, uh, and this varies country by country, but to do a couple of things, um, including app tracing that we talked about before, right? So a lot of the big tech companies have rolled out various tracing apps, but the difference between the EU and US approach here is come should come as no surprise, the US approach has been really fractured, right? So the big tech companies, so Apple, um, Google rolled out these tracing apps, but then in the US context, left it up to the states, basically to come up with their own state level versions of this and to kind of push those out on a voluntary basis um, to their citizens. There are the states were doing, trying to do quite a lot else in March, April, May timeframe. And as a result, frankly, plenty of states just didn't do it. Um, that's, kind of, that's caused the big 10 companies in the US to go back to the drawing board. Basically, they're trying to do this themselves now and push it out to all of us. But still, we have a de minimis uptake of these tracing apps um, here in the US, right? And it'll be interesting in an incoming Biden administration, the degree to which the federal government gets involved, because then we do have other, you know, interesting debates that we can have around um, around privacy when that state action really comes into the equation. In the EU, there already has been state action, right? A lot of the tracing apps have come from national governments um, in partnership, you know, with these big tech companies. And there's certain privacy protections they've tried to build in. So not using GPS, for example, for tracing, but these kind of, I don't want to get too technical, but using Bluetooth in creative ways to be able to show, you know, who you are, where you are, who you've come in contact with. And even some more basic ones in Greece, for example, you got to send a text message when you leave your house, right? So it's not exactly like, you know, bleeding edge technology issues here. Um, and it is possible to use it more effectively. I think one other interesting change we've seen is in the EU, you know, they have one of the most robust privacy regimes in the world that we've kind of alluded to already. Um, but they've also been quite flexible with regard to the types of information that's being collected in the name of public health. And, you know, they've been pretty out in front with that debate. Still, we have some countries um, that are, you know, reticent um, to engage in a really deep way uh, in some of that. So, you know, we have the Netherlands, we have Sweden, for example, not wanting to collect personal um, health information, such as temperature checks, stuff like that, unless it's, you know, anonymized um, in keeping with GDPR. Others, um, like the Dutch, have been a little bit more flexible in that regard. So, you know, it's interesting because I think it just goes to show you can still have a, you know, really robust privacy re regime. And at least up until a month or so ago, um, you know, 
pretty adequate response at dealing with this um, global pandemic. So they don't necessarily have to be those two ideas at loggerheads. You wouldn't mind, Angie, going to the next uh, screen there. So that's a little bit about the app tracing you know, debate. I think it's interesting to think about, especially that last bullet point, and we can get more into that during the discussion as well, how we can bake in you know, these privacy uh, by design principles, especially looking ahead now to what looks to be a much more aggressive, coordinated federal level US response. Um, if we actually have, for example, a COVID dashboard in the US, along with some you know, suggested you know, tracing apps, et cetera, you know, what could that look like? Um, if we were, you know, dubbed, as we saw earlier today, as members of the transition team, you know, coronavirus task force tasked with thinking about the impact of privacy and cybersecurity in these times, um, what would we want to have baked into these systems, right? And I think in part of that process, we can learn from, you know, what's worked in Europe by using, you know, Bluetooth, et cetera, um, uh, and, and, they, and frankly, empowering our, our world leading tech sector to help us with that. But at the same time, you know, being mindful of the fact that we don't have, you know, these same federal level privacy protections. So whether that means going along with the now revised, you know, CCPA standards um, or trying to find some area of overlap with how other, you know, hopefully once again, closer allies like the EU are engaging with this, uh, you know, will be helpful because at the end of the day, it's a global issue and we're only going to get a handle on it if we uh, if we act in those terms. So um, happy to talk about that. Um, in further detail, right before this, I was working on this list of 17 um, cyber peace goals modeled after the sustainable development goals. So this has gotten my wheels turning already about how we can, like I said, uh, be more be more proactive and and uh, build a more you know just and equitable regime going forward. So thank you so much again for doing this, Angie, and uh, look forward to the discussion. So hello everyone again. That's the panel overview. So we're open for questions at this point in time. Um, and I suppose I will stop sharing, but if we do need to go back to these slides, I'm happy to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've got to. Okay. So, for... oh, oh, sorry, Andy. No, no, no. I was just going to say for anybody interested, I'm going to put this in the chat box. This is a good ZDNet article that kind of goes down all the different cybersecurity challenges because I didn't even have a chance to talk more about um, the whole you know, uh, rigmarole um, about trade secrets protections and these the vaccine research, including the new Pfizer you know, vaccine that was uh, announced earlier today. So we can take this discussion, in other words, in a lot of directions, depending on people's interests. Um, we'll do it. Oh, I love that one, Marty. You want to jump yeah. in and start, Scott? Can everyone yeah. see? The chat no, no, no worries. No, I, do you want me to repeat the question? No, no, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Marty. Marty asks, "How do you all feel about Harry's Homo Duis?" And I think I just butchered that name. Harari's Homo Duis. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, maybe for those you know unfamiliar, this is the idea. Great book, great book, by the way. Right, this this brief history of tomorrow about you know, what happens when we're so deeply um, ingrained with our technologies, right? Including AI, that's brought up you know, in this as well as genetic engineering. Um, and and you know, even um, kind of going frankly, pretty closely aligned with this idea from Brett Frischman of re-engineering humanity, right? Could we re-engineer ourselves more effectively in this context, maybe to deal with the next pandemic so that we're, uh, we have more resilient immune systems. Maybe um, uh, we could use technology in a more you know, meaningful way to have it quickly show up, for example, when somebody is um, infected. Uh, maybe there could be some you know, implanted device even that can, it automatically tells others around there about, you know, th this person has you know, this, these types of uh, you know, symptoms or issues, you know, stay clear. It could automatically inform the public health authorities. Talk about massive, you know, privacy challenges, but that's all part and parcel of this, you know, um, of those emerging trends. And I think it's, you know, it, it's fascinating to raise some of that now because a lot of it is, you know, pie in the sky. But at the same time, you know, um, this whole uh, era, I think of, you know, working remotely, of socializing remotely, etc. Yeah, that's going to change. Let's hope sooner rather than later. But I think some of these habits are going to be kind of tougher, uh, going to be more challenging to break. Um, so relying more on technology. I think this is just, you know, in some ways pushing that IoT wave even a bit further than would have happened otherwise. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that it's a great way to kind of queue up maybe a broader discussion among all the panelists about, you know, what 
what do we do right in this um, in this future to kind of do that balancing act as you started talking about at the beginning, Janine, to build these kind of resilient systems to make use of these technologies without sacrificing our human rights along the way. So I'm going to go to, to Janine next in the in the question and answers. Alan has asked, you know, trust is I'm assuming people can see this. so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but trust is a thorny issue, um, you know, Alan says, I have a really hard time trusting that any data I provide to any provider will be securely stored and only used for its intended purposes. That's probably an unfair quick summary. But Janine, this is going to uh, the concept of trust. And then I'll turn to Isak as well about human rights uh, really quickly, or not quickly. So Janine, you want to feed off of that? If it's okay, I'm just going to really quickly give an example of a, a decision that the Commonwealth of Virginia made when it um, adopted its COVID tracing app. And that is a Bluetooth um, application like you were talking about, Scott. So it tells the individuals if they've been in contact with someone who has also been um, um, found to be COVID positive. And that's a, that's a decision they made because um, if you think about it, there are a lot of people who have not downloaded those apps because of the lack of trust, which is getting exactly to what this person is asking. Um, how, how There is little trust right now. And without that trust, um, you're not going to have patients actually talking to their doctors because the data that they give their doctors will simply be shared. They, even if the doctor, and this is different from confidentiality, even if the because the systems are different than the doctors. And, and this is a big issue that if we want the technologies in the United States um, to progress is an issue we need to address. Um, laws could help like Rachel has talked about. Um, if we had more protection like the GDPR. Um, I studied in Sweden, I was a professor in Sweden for a little bit um, and the way that they looked at privacy and the way that they collected data in the health system. Um, and so that was very interesting. Um, I think with AI, we could have a whole nother panel on AI. So I probably, but I, I feel like um, we have to be really careful about AI in particular and the data that goes into it because we have no accountability. We have zero. Um, and I would also suggest there's a very new book out, Frank uh, Pasquale and the New Laws of Robotics, something like that. It's a really great book. It talks about adding some more um, accountability things as well. Um, and so I'll stop because I've said enough for now, but great questions. Isak? I, I think that there's there's a couple of things. I, the the first is a big question about who. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so when we're talking about trust, it's about, you know, who controls the data. Um, you know, so... Um, uh, I believe his name is Pedro Dominguez. Um, I, I now I forgot his name, but he wrote the master algorithm. Um, you know, he makes this argument when talking about data-driven technologies that um, that if we can't control, if we're if we're worried about who's going to get control, then we should just open all the data, right? So it should just be totally open source. Um, so if we can't make sure that it's only in the hands of the quote-unquote good guys, right? Um, but I but I mean. To, to me, that, and that sort of ties into these questions that uh, people are also asking about, you know, when you're, you're, we're mentioning Netflix, but we're also mentioning China and Singapore. And I think that those are very different considerations um, uh, when it comes to questions of trust um, and, and what type of, you know, how I'm willing to trust them um, uh, to use my data and for what. Um, so so I, think that, I think that that's a really important question there. So it's also popped up and, and maybe I'll go to this one to Rachel first and sorry, throwing you under the bus. Um, but the questions popped up of how do um, these different regimes actually handle privacy? Because obviously the, the more centralized regimes with more um, centralized control, the argument is at least can be put forward that they, they are in fact deploying these apps that seem to have some type of, of benefit to the betterment of mankind, whatever that means. And I definitely don't want you to take that up. But can you talk through a little bit about how those privacy rules are different? So I, I think there have been sort of two questions around right. around privacy and, and either the deployment of AI or the deployment of contact tracing apps. And 
I I do think that there there's a difference in the way that regimes have focused on this and really the ability of governments to mandate participation in a contact tracing app, such as in Singapore or China. Um, you know, the I think at the very early outset, you had the um, PDPC in Singapore say there are privacy risks associated with, I think theirs is called Test Track or um, I, I don't remember the name of the contact tracing app, but he acknowledged at the beginning, there are very real privacy risks, but you have to weigh that against um, against the benefit that they they offer to society. And they've seen success there, um, but they also have, you know, they have parameters set for how to secure the data. Um, and they've been a little bit more transparent maybe than other regimes. And I, I do think that you're seeing different, the, the different values that countries place on privacy. Um, whereas in, in Europe, even countries that have that sort of contract tracing in place, um, there were all kinds of conversations happening with DPAs on how to sort of set the parameters or the guardrails around how to either anonymize that data, um, secure that data. Um, so I, I think that really the contact tracing case study that Scott brought up has highlighted the way that we, around the, around the world, we balance privacy in a different way. Scott, I see you nodding. Would you like to jump in on that or would you, should we move on to a different um, question? I have a tendency to agree with Rachel, as you can tell. Okay, yeah, <laughs> just check it. For that matter. Um, but no, just, just think kind of piggybacking off of that a little bit. Um, so we, and we do a little bit of this in that governing, you know, AI article, but I think it is kind of a foundational point and it's a good one to raise of who owns your data. And as, as we're kind of discussing, it really depends on where in the world we're talking about, right? Um, and in those countries that practice this idea of cyber sovereignty, uh, which is not just, of course, you know, China and Russia, but through the Belt of Road initiative and otherwise that's, you know, in quickly encompassing large parts of the world in Asia, Latin America, Africa, um, even parts of Europe, you know, for that matter, that that that's really fundamental. And as we think about, you know, for example, revising or updating, you know, international human rights laws, including our right to privacy. That's all well and good, but if we don't have, you know, if there's a growing divergence kind of lurking under that in the, and to say nothing of the governance structures themselves, but even the architecture that these systems are built on and where that data is flowing and why, um, it's going to be really tough to come to, you know, a more global understanding. So that's why I think, you know, frankly, you know, Lynn and Vincent's work around polycentric governance and how we can get these, you know, smaller clubs, these mini lateral clubs working together whether that's through the Five Eyes or NATO or even the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm -hmm. that seems to be the way forward to me. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Janine, you were gonna jump in. Would you still like to? No, I, I, really quickly, I think that, uh, you know, in the US we've always uh, looked at um, self-regulation of privacy and privacy protection um, that is evolving. We have the privacy framework by NIST and I, I think we have to stop thinking about privacy as just data protection. And then lastly, I've been doing this for so long, I just cringe when people say to balance privacy because privacy tends to lose. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I know that there's nothing wrong with that word, but if there was another word for saying we need to have both, you know, we can do both, we can have it, but we can make that choice. Mm -hmm. We have to say that we're gonna have that choice. So we're looking for other questions here. So um, yay, I agree. I don't use the word privacy. Um, but I wanted to ask, yeah, okay. So Adam picked up what I was going to ask. Um, it, sort of, I think, you know, we have, at least in the United States, which is quasi what we're talking about, at least at the moment, um, you know, a large group of people who don't trust scientists, don't trust research, don't just fill in the blank. The absence of trust is is at a all time high, I think. Um, and so, you know, what are you know, Adam's commenting on the U.S. elections and the deep divides. So, what are first steps? Mike's even you know feeding into that. You know, what is the first steps? What is some basic practical advice for us to take these first steps to overcome this massive issue as it relates to trust? in the face of a health crisis, a massive pandemic. And I've now used massive twice, so apologies. Um, Rachel, I haven't called on you for a while. So if that's outside your bailiwick, I appreciate it. But uh, do you wanna have first 
first go at this? I'm not sure that anyone would have an absolute perfect response to this. I think there's one thing that just going back to Janine's last point about, um, I couldn't agree more on when you say balance privacy with anything, whether that could be um, with this with public health, that could be with national security after a, a terrorist attack, or it could just be with cybersecurity because you're trying to secure your data more, um, you know, that privacy tends to lose. So it's, I view it as kind of trying to find the smaller things to, to nudge in the correct direction. So maybe we can't get perfect accountability or perfect privacy or the perfect balance, but how do we do better than nothing? Um, for me, that's personally where I think um, where we I think we need to go. But I think the election has made clear that there, there are deep divisions in our country. But at the same time, I also think that whether or not the election highlighted it, I think there's a lot of common ground as well. So I want to I want to jump in um, on one thing. I will I had a conversation early today where I reminded a group of more tech driven individuals that there are actually solutions to tons of this, but it oftentimes involves for us a trade off between how long I want it to take for me to log in, for example, or how. So I reject the notion that what we need is individuals to be responsible for stuff, everything. This is um, just simply not possible, not realistic, and about 30 seconds after you create some massive long password for people to be expected to enter in these passphrases, people type in ridiculously common, well-predictable passphrases that are a whole series of curse words usually, and they're incredibly predictable because people find these things very frustrating. So, you know, that is an area that I think we need to be really careful about is allowing this narrative to push forward of individuals have to be responsible and they just need to do more. They need to keep a better eye on it. They need to read all the terms of service. We're long past those days, uh, in my opinion. And I'm not suggesting any panel has said that, but it's a topic that we haven't even talked about at all. And it's a narrative that's being pushed out pretty frequently right now. So that's my personal opinion on that. I think Janine wanted to hop in because she's unmuted, which is sort of the secret um, moderator signal for I have something to say. So Janine, did you want to jump in? Uh, well, no, not, I, I didn't want to jump in front of anybody else, but I, I think what Scott said um, earlier about um, the Ostrom principles is, is something that I think is, again, and agreeing with Rachel that nobody has the um, answer. Even though um, a national approach is important, I think because people gain their trust in our, our society here in different ways, that there have to be multiple avenues for um, how to um, address the pandemic from a governmental standpoint. You know, a totally top-down approach I don't think would work. It has to be multiple layers of approaches like, um, you know, the Ostrom principles have, have proven um, for so long. That's just the only thing that I was thinking that is agreeing with the other panelists here. So Mike has a question that might be a perfect one to wrap up on and is quite honestly a, a little bit less complex, but um, it, it will feed into each of our individual knowledge areas very well. Some practical advice for what individuals should do in relation to their computers, their phones, their social media accounts in general. Um, I'm gonna, I, I can answer first. My answer to this is always be an informed consumer, but it's becoming more and more difficult. So I remind even my husband, you know, when your your Apple Watch vibrates and your phone is going off, that doesn't happen accidentally. There are connections that are occurring and that requires some, some moments of sharing. And as long as you understand that, and you don't need to be a tech wizard, you just understand the basics of it's possible you can shut that off. If you don't want it, certain bits of information flying through, you know, space, <laughs> which I try not to be too techy, if, you know, that type of stuff, um, you know, you need to pay attention to how technology is reacting to your behavior and then recognize it's not an accident. And if you don't like it, shut it off. Um, it, so that's my basic advice. But I see Scott shaking his head. So I know Scott has some advice and I'll just sort of go around and these are parting words as well um, because we're running, we're officially running short of time. 
like so I said, Andy, I, I have a tendency to agree with you. So no, that's great advice. <laughs> the um the the in the chat box there, guys, I, I put up a link to an op-ed that I did on this topic. Not comprehensive, but it was a year and a half ago or so. And a lot of these ideas, um, they're not they're not rocket science, just computer science, right? But they're still very valid, unfortunately, here at the end of uh, 2020. So you know. It, you know, keep yourself up to date. That's really important. Um, be automatic, as Angie said, we're not gonna remember to do this stuff. So when in doubt, um, make everything automatically updatable. Um, be mindful of the, you know, different browsers that you're using. You can use ones like DuckDuckGo, you know, that put your private information, um, you know, at, at the frankly front and center of the search experience rather than having it be an afterthought or some extra thing you have to download, right? Um, it, I know it's tough to remember those passwords as Angie alluded to. So think about a password manager. You're putting all your eggs in one basket with that. So if the likes of LastPass gets hacked, we're all in for a world of hurt. Um, but frankly, it's an opportunity cost. So it's all relative. So if that's better than you using the same password for your, you know, your Facebook and your bank login, then do that, right? You know, enable multi-factor against across you know, all these different devices, especially these days with ransomware being so endemic. Backing up data is important, but just remember to do it locally as well as in the cloud, ideally. So you have multiple backups, whether that's for yourself or for a small business. Um, and ideally try to do that as often as possible, right? So if you have you know, a cloud backup that can take place every day, so you won't be mindful um, or necessarily have to, have to be mindful or lose much if you uh, are the victim of a ransomware attack. The last one I recommend, if you haven't done it already, freeze your credit. You don't need your credit open, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. You only need it open when you have to, you know, open up a new uh, credit card or a new loan, something like that. So the rest of the time, it should be frozen. And frankly, I'd argue that should be the default, right? That's an easy reform that I think everybody would agree with, except for the credit reporting agencies, but they don't count, right? Because we're the, we're the products, we're not the customers for them. Um, so go to the three big credit reporting, bu reporting bureaus and make sure that your uh, credit reports are frozen and for your kids too, frankly. So I'll get off my uh, uh, high horse now, Angie, sorry, and pass the baton. It's okay, Isak, we haven't heard from you for a while, so we'll give you the parting word. So other than those very practical things, you know, throw away all of your devices. Um, but, <laughs> um, no, but obviously, you know, if, <laughs> you know, when, when I think, I think the realization sort of looking forward is that our data are not that interesting by themselves, but collectively. Um, and so I think a practical step moving forward out of the COVID-19 pandemic is for us to be more, uh, to engage in advocacy um, on a collective level about what companies are doing with our data um, so that we collectively with our sort of collective market power um, decide how we want that to look in the future, you know, um, and, and the rights that we want. So, um, that, 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 that's what I would say we need to be working toward. I'd like to just personally thank our panelists for the wonderful discussion. Thank you all for joining us and for engaging in the conversation. Hopefully it's been useful. Um, I'm going to turn it. I see Marty's jumped in. Would you like it to go back to you? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Angie, for thanking the panel. And then I'll thank you in a kind of Domino effect way. Thanks for organizing and leading here. Uh, I just have a couple of parting remarks very quickly. It's all about collective action. So this is very appropriate for this particular venue, CBIE, IASC, and the workshop in Indiana. And the last thing I'd like to emphasize, uh, one of the panelists mentioned, Brett Frischman. He wrote it, it's probably worth reading. He wrote the book, Infrastructure. And I always talk about various types of infrastructure. Trust being an example of social infrastructure, which economists call social capital. But whatever. You call it what you wish, but uh, it's interesting that uh, the investment in social social infrastructure is, uh, it's expensive. It takes a lot of time to build relationships and they evaporate very quickly. And um, uh, the importance of trust as infrastructure in our systems is incredibly high. So um, it's definitely worth thinking about how we build and maintain trust um, in coupled infrastructure systems. So with that, I'll close off and thank everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us.